How's it guys, this is Davey FP and welcome back to the Fantasy Premier League video here on my channel. Now in this video, I'll take you guys through my team selection for the upcoming Game Week 6. So hopefully Game Week 5 was an absolute banger for you guys. For ourselves, we captained Mo Salah but still managed to get a green arrow. So comment down below how many points you guys ended on and if you did captain Mo Salah, hopefully you still managed to get a green arrow. So as with all team selection videos, I'm going to be going over a quick review of Game Week 5. However, in yesterday's video, the transfer plan, I went over it in a little bit more in depth. So if you guys want an in-depth analysis, go check that video out because this video, it's going to be a very quick run through. And then going to turn our attention to the upcoming Game Week 6, which is going to be a Saturday morning afternoon deadline, wherever you guys are around the world. And make sure you guys check out my deadline stream one hour before the deadline coming up. So super fast turnaround between Game Week 5 and Game Week 6. I'm going to go over my Game Week 6 team selection first and then show you how I plan to use one or two free transfers and 0.5 in the bank. So that's something you guys are interested in. Sit back, relax, and let's get straight into it. So going over the quick, as I said, very quick review of Game Week 5. There is still a game actually happening tonight. Because I'm actually going into work tomorrow, I'm having to record this on Thursday night. So just keep that in mind when I do talk about my transfer plan as well as my team selection. But as of before the United vs Leicester game, you guys can see my stats on the bottom right hand side. 84 total points for the upcoming game week. As I mentioned, let me know how many points you guys ended on. I do think 84 points is pretty respectable considering the fact that we captain Mo Salah. So current 1.2 million game week rank, that's going to probably go down off the United vs Leicester game. And we have just crept into the top million, which I'm super happy with as kind of a placeholder for the opening five game weeks. The bottom right shows you two free chances and 0.5 in the bank, but you guys will have to wait for a little bit late into the video when I do talk about how I plan to use them. So the first talking point is going to be on the bench. You guys can see that Ward still has to play United tonight. Is he going to keep a clean sheet? Who kind of knows? Probably won't, as this is defense is pretty bad. But we might actually need him now that Ramsdale is currently injured. But the biggest talking point on the bench is going to be Reese James. We obviously got the news that Reese James was out with an illness, not an injury for game week five and therefore missed that game against Southampton. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Who kind of knows? Probably would have lost their clean sheet anyways, but he might have got an attacking return. But I guess the big talking point is the fact that we still kept hold of Reese James. A lot of people were actually transferring him out. I trusted Andres Pereira to be a replacement for him. I really just needed my starting 11 to all feature because I had no bench coverage. That's what I kind of thought going into Game Week 5. But as you guys can see, Diallo actually started the Chelsea game, got us two points, which might have been quite useful if one of our starting 11 players didn't feature. But going back to Reese James, I'm pretty happy I actually kept hold of him. And in our team selection, I plan to start him as he has been back in training. The final player on our bench is going to bring us nothing but disappointment. I know, how can you be disappointed at your third bench position? But last night he actually dropped some price. So currently 4.4, his only job to keep hold of his value, he couldn't even do that. So talking about Ward and potentially keeping a clean sheet, let's go to our starting 11 where Ramsdale only got us two points. So if Ward outperforms him, I'm going to be quite disappointed. Now Ramsdale did concede a goal that could have actually been a foul, might have not been, depends on what side you kind of look at it. Might have been a little bit soft, but I mean, I would have taken it as I might have preserved that precious clean sheet. Now the big talking point came out of game week 5 was the fact that Arteta said after the game that Ramsdale was actually injured in the fixture. He picked up an injury kind of mid-game, but he still managed to finish the fixture, but he will be assessed before the weekend. So he might actually be injured for game week 6, and therefore a transfer might be used on him. Going on to our back line, we had Trent with 2 points, our Man City double up, Walker and Cancelo both getting us returns. Just the clean sheet for Walker, which is perfectly fine. I just needed him to start and get 60 minutes. That's exactly what he did. And then Cancelo got a goal, but also the clean sheet. Now it was a little bit weird for me that Cancelo got a goal and a clean sheet as a defender and still only managed to get zero bonus points. Thought maybe one or two would have come about, but just shows you how well Man City played and his other Man City options, they generally just share the points. The points are definitely not shared between the Chelsea assets though. Cucurella ending on one point as my only kind of sole Chelsea defender was hoping for a clean sheet there as he is a little bit of a differential. But don't you know what's happened to that Chelsea defense? Can't seem to buy a clean sheet at the moment that are slightly worrying as I do own two of them. But Man City definitely carried out offense this week, but that is expected as they were playing Nottingham Forest. Going on to midfield apartment, and obviously the biggest talking point is the Mo Salah captaincy versus the Haaland captaincy. Mo Salah getting two assists, one really late into the fixture, which I was super happy about. Now I mentioned this over on Twitter, but if you guys own both Haaland and Salah and you captain Salah, the difference was about seven points between the captaincy options. And when the game started for Liverpool and Haaland already had a hat trick, I was quite pleased with him getting 10 points. So on another day, 10 points would have been fine for a captain, but just because Haaland was captained by so many options and managed to score a hat-trick, that 10 points looks quite measly. Luis Diaz, on the other hand, had more chances than Salah to score, actually rounded Pope uh, early on in the game, but didn't manage to hit the target, and I was a little bit disappointed with that, but still, always looks lively, always involved in that Liverpool attack, so a definite hold for me. 
Andres Pereira came in for six points, so basically a clean sheet from Reese James. I'll take that any day of the week, especially because he kind of got an assist for the dunk own goal. So that might sound harsh. I know I advised you guys to buy and dunk, and I would have done myself if Reese James was confirmed out for a long time. So that's going to be that little bit of luck that we actually needed. Then finally, Martinelli, I always call him Mr. Consistent, but luckily the double-digit hawk came in this week, a massive 10 points, and winning Arsenal the game. Now, I can't really say anything more about Martelli because he's just one of the best options for value in the game at the current moment, and I'd heavily suggest getting him if you guys don't. Going on to our forward line, Jesus got one goal, Haaland got three goals. What more needs to be said about our forward line, at least both of them got some attacking returns, but definitely the missed captaincy on Haaland is a little bit tough to take. Now just going on this captaincy decision, for me it was kind of a 50-50. In the deadline stream I mentioned that I was basically 51% towards Salah because I thought he would get more minutes. That was true, he got about 90 minutes, although Liverpool were chasing the game, whereas Haaland only got about 65. But overall, because of the Salah captain with those 10 points, the rest of our team really carried us. Finally, the Man City double clean sheet, 84 points. We basically halved our rank, which I was super happy about. Let me know how you guys got on. If you did Captain Salah, what was the biggest kind of green arrow we can get? 50% for me is pretty respectable, but there might have been those of you out there with a certain differential that got even a bigger rank rise. So let me know in the comments down below. But now going on to our actual game week six team selection. And the reason I've done this before the transfer plan is I want to give you guys some context to what I'm currently dealing with. And then we can discuss kind of the variations of transfers that I could potentially do. Now heading into game week six, I do have two free transfers and 0.5 in the bank. So I definitely will be doing one transfer as my squad still needs some improvement. But what I want to mention again is that I'm currently recording this on Thursday evening. This is before we got Ramsdale news. Is Ramsdale back or not? Who kind of knows? Is Reese James back or not? We have had some training videos that show him in training, but who kind of knows if he's actually going to be back fit? So just keep that in mind, but I will update you guys as always on my Discord channel or just watch the deadline stream one hour before the deadline. Starting off with our bench department, and these bench options kind of pick themselves. Andreas Pereira has a very tough game against Spurs this week, and that's I'm not super confident, even though Fulham are actually playing a decent brand of football, I think he's going to be a nice first bench option that, if needed, could come off. Diallo against Wolves, who knows even if he's going to start again, then Archer definitely won't start. Even if he did, I wouldn't play him against Man City. The only option on the bench that might actually play is going to be Danny Ward against Brighton away. Now, very tough fixture on paper. Brighton are playing excellently this Premier League season, and Leicester's defense is simply tragic. However, if Ramsdale is going to be out with an injury, I could always just play Danny Ward because the distance between the goalkeepers usually isn't that much, and the points gained on goalkeepers isn't that high. But yes, currently I've got Danny Ward on the bench, but he could come off, but I always might just make a goalkeeper transfer. Going on to our starting 11 and starting off with Ramsdale, that's probably the biggest talking point in our defensive department. Is he injured? Is he not? Who kind of knows? But I do know that Arteta is probably at a press conference as you guys are watching this video. So if he is going to be back fit, I'll probably just keep him. But if he is going to be out, I'll probably transfer him out. If he is fit though, that United away fixture is probably going to be quite tough on paper, even though United haven't been generally playing that well this season against the better sides like a Liverpool. They put on a good show and I do think both sides will score in this one. So that's why even if Ramsdale is fit, I still might take him out because simply not getting the save points, not getting the bonus points, and has been a little bit of a dud for my team. But I think until we get news in the press conference, I'm simply just going to play him in my starting 11. Moving on to our back line, our only Liverpool defender has Everton away, a very tough Merseyside derby. Everton are not really playing that well, but they still are scoring a few goals, Anthony Gordon especially, and that's why I do worry about this trend clean sheet. But as you guys know, Liverpool always generally perform quite well in this derby, but because it's going to be away, this might be quite a tough one. Added to that, they also have the Champions League on the horizon against Napoli in the midweek, and therefore we might see some reduced minutes for Trent and someone like Asala. But still, Trent's going nowhere, has the potential to absolutely haul. This fixture on paper looks fine, so I'm going to simply play him and hope for the best. Going on to Man City, double up of Cancelo and Kyle Walker. Kyle Walker played 90 minutes against Nottingham Forest yesterday, whereas Cancelo played about 60 to 65, I think. So Cancelo should be fine for the weekend, whereas Kyle Walker I'm slightly worried about. Now the fixture looks pretty strong, Aston Villa have been struggling, Stevie G looks like he's under a lot of pressure, and what a worse time to have than Man City. But Man City can keep a clinch against anyone, hopefully both these two players start, but I am generally worried about Walker, as Gomez came off the bench, and don't exactly know if he's ready for a start, but with the fixture congestion, who kind of knows what Pep Rillette's going to do. What I want you guys to do is comment down below, do you think Kyle Walker's fine for the weekend, or do you think he'll be rotated before the Champions League fixture next midweek? And then rounding off our defense is our final double up in the defensive department, Reese James and Kukurela. So currently I'm just going to go with the fact that Reese James should be back for the weekend. He has been pictured in training, but we will get more news from Tuchel in the press conference tomorrow. Now I do expect both these two options to actually start the fixture. I think there might be enough rest time between them. And in terms of the Champions League fixture coming up next week, they should win that fixture. Now West Ham at home, West Ham a team that not really been playing that well. Yes, they did score against Spurs yesterday, but West Ham actually have a reduced amount of recovery time between game week five and six, and therefore they might be quite leggy. 
So currently I am confident if James and Kukurela both start this game, yes it is going to be a London derby but I'm expecting big things, finally hopefully Chelsea keep a clean sheet and one or two attacking returns come from this pairing. Moving on to our midfield apartment, I've got Salah and Diaz both against Everton. Not really expecting too much out of this fixture. I think Everton will be quite cagey, especially because this will be an away game for Liverpool. And right now, Liverpool's attack isn't flowing that well. Yes, they did win 9-0 against Bournemouth. Yes, I do know that. But the fact that last night they struggled against Newcastle. Yes, Newcastle are a great side, but I think Everton will be quite big at the back. But nevertheless, Salah, Diaz, they're going nowhere. Great fixture like Trent on paper. So hopefully they do provide the goods and pick up some form. The big thing to note about the Liverpool attack is that Darwin is going to be back from his suspension. While I don't necessarily think that he might actually start the fixture, they might go for Firmino, bring Darwin on for the last 20 to 30 minutes. That might be a consideration in the future. Our final midfielder to go for is going to be Martinelli against United. Now United's defense has actually picked up form over these past couple of game weeks. Arsenal look good from an attacking point of view. Martinelli looks good. So I'm really hoping that the attack of Arsenal beats the defense of United. But even if it doesn't, at his price point and what he's done over these prior game weeks, he's proved his value in gold. And then finally go on to our forward line, the first player I want to talk about and the big kind of talking point is Erling Haaland and is he actually going to start this fixture against Aston Villa. So he played 65 minutes yesterday against Nottingham Forest, there might be enough recovery time before then and the Champions League for him to actually start but I think he might actually be benched this one. So yes finally you might be getting that Erling Haaland benching but even if he is benched I do think he can actually get you some points in the last 20 to 30 minutes. So let's just hope that either he starts the fixture or if he is benched comes off for a respectable amount of time. That Villa defense is looking pretty bad, the Villa team overall is looking bad, Man City look red hot and therefore even if Haaland gets about 10 to 20 minutes I still think he might get an attacking return. So that's why I was so against kind of taking him to Kane because I do still think that Harry Kane and Haaland might be fine even though Kane might actually play more minutes. Then the final option, Jesus continue his scoring streak in game week 5, will that continue in game week 6 hopefully, but I won't probably captain him because his fixture on paper looks slightly tough. So post-production Dave, you're going to hop on this track because I simply forgot to talk to you guys about captaincy, so no ultimate guide this week, so I will be giving you guys some recommendations at the end of this kind of segment, but in terms of my captain for game week 6, it's currently going to be on Salah. So between Salah and Haaland, I think yet again, like game week 5, game week 6 is going to be between these two assets. I just feel like now that Haaland's played that 65 minutes, yes, he actually did have his minutes managed, but I'm just not super confident on a full start for him on the weekend. Now, I know it's the early kickoff, but I'm not going to stick to that kind of stigma, that superstition. I'm going to be backing the GOAT that is going to be most Salah. Now, captaincy this week is definitely a hard debate to go for. It's not really cut and dry. It's not really between Salah and Haaland. It could be between another few assets. And the two assets that I'm currently looking at are Kane or KDB. So if you guys do have Kevin De Bruyne, I would definitely captain in my favorite captaincy option for game week six. And Harry Kane against Fulham at home should also provide some good threat. So yes, thanks for listening to this kind of captaincy segment. If you guys have any comments, drop them down below. So overall guys, as you guys can see, the team looks fine on paper. However, when you kind of look closer, Kyle Walker, we also have Erling Haaland might be benched. We then have Reese James who might be injured. Ramsdale might be injured. With two free transfers, how can we actually fix this team? So now going on to the transfer plan for the upcoming game week six and the first transfer I want to talk about is going to be about Ramsdale because as you guys know, I've mentioned this enough, he could potentially be out for game week six. So yes, that game week six fixture is actually quite tough against United away and we could always play Danny Ward, but I just don't trust that Leicester defense. And therefore, if he is going to be out for game week six, I might use this as an opportunity to take him out because he hasn't been providing the goods. Now, a goalkeeper that has actually been playing pretty well, plays for an equally if not better defense, is going to be the Brighton man, Sanchez. Now comparing those fixtures of Arsenal to Brighton, yes Arsenal do have Everton at home next week, Brentford away in game week at 8, but Brighton's fixtures on paper also look pretty strong. Leicester at home in a quick turnaround from game week 5 to game week 6, Bournemouth away which is a great fixture, and then finally Crystal Palace at home which might be the only tough one in the next 3. But even if it is going to be a tough game, I do expect Sanchez to get more save points than Ramsdale, and that's why this move might be worth it in the long run. So yes, if Ramsdale's going to be out, I think if he's going to be fine for game week six, I might just keep him. I think he's good enough to kind of keep, might not be worth, as I mentioned, using a free transfer on a goalkeeper. But if you don't have anything else to do, I might just do this move for free. Now I just want to put this out there that there are some other transfer combinations that I could have done. If you guys watched the transfer plan yesterday, I spoke about potentially bringing Gross in, bringing Tony in, these sort of options, using two free transfers. Yes, I might do this, but in the team selection, I always like to be a little bit more conservative and give you options that uh, probably will happen if these options are injured. But saying that though, I might still do those formational changes, but I just didn't want to repeat too much content between the two videos. So now we've covered that talking point, I'm going to be going over another chance that I could potentially make, and it's going to be about Kyle Walker. So as I mentioned in my team selection for game week 6, I'm generally worried about Kyle Walker because he's played about 90 minutes in every one of the games this Premier League season for Man City, and therefore a rest is on the cards. 
Now that rest might never come. I mean, Kyle Walker could just be super fit. He might play a position that doesn't really require that much distance traveled, speed acceleration, that sort of thing. So he might actually be fine and fit to play every single game. But let's just say that in terms of the predicted lineups, we do get news from maybe Pep in the press conference. He says that Kyle Walker might be rested. I could easily do a switch for him. Now the first option on paper is going to be like Sanchez, also from Brighton, it's going to be Lewis Dunk. So I know, why would I bring a player that just scored an own goal? Well, maybe I've said that he's got his own goal out for the season and he won't score another one. If we do bring him in, let's just hope so. And as mentioned with Sanchez, Brighton has some lovely fixtures coming up. Now between Dunk and someone like a Webster, we could go for either of them. We could even go for the new man, Estupanan, but I just generally worry about some rotation on him. So this could be one transfer that we do if we get news about Walker maybe potentially being rotated, as might be expected. This move does look strong for the future. The nice thing about this is that if you do look at the fixtures, yes, Aston Villa is a great fixture, but then next week's Spurs will be a tough game. Spurs usually do well against Man City. Lewis Dunk might actually be better over those two. But sticking with Kyle Walker, another alternative trance that I could potentially do is going to be for Kieran Trippier. So with that 0.5 in the bank, I can use that extra 0.1 to buy Kieran Trippier as the Newcastle fixtures are going to improve from game week 6 onwards. You can see that Crystal Palace at home might be a tough game, West Ham away is a fine game, and then Bournemouth at home is a plum fixture, and that's how I want some Newcastle coverage. Securing Trippier allows me to kind of dip my toe into that Newcastle team, and then come game week 8 against Bournemouth at home, I might actually go for another attacker. Now between Trippier and Dunk, it's actually quite close between them, don't you know how I'm going to decide on that move. The attacking threat of Trippier might just lean me towards going for him. So yes guys, this is going to wrap up with the transfer plan. As I mentioned, I could still do those Gross and Tony moves with two free transfers, but if Ramsdale's not injured, I'll go for Sanchez, and then I still might do this move for Walker, as I do have two frees. So let me know in the comments down below what you guys think about these moves. Do you like them? Is an alternative that you guys would go for? I mean, Trippier and Dunk look pretty good. I mean, even Sanchez could be a good option, but maybe you suggest the Henderson, that sort of thing. What are you guys thinking down below? But this is Asker Up the video, guys. Hope you did enjoy it. Please don't forget to like if you did and subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. I'll be seeing you guys in the deadline stream one hour before the deadline on Saturday, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you guys are around the world. But I'm just signing off. It's been Davey FPL, and I'm out. Cheers. Bye.